All right, here we go in three, two, one. Hello, Facebook world, and welcome to another coronavirus update edition. And today I'm very excited to have Dr. Karen Becker and our special guest, Dr. Weiss, with us. There's a lot of conflicting headlines right now all over the world. You have European headlines, you have North American headlines, two different types of panic coming from both ends. So we brought the good Dr. Weiss today to kind of help us sort some of this madness out. Now, if you're not familiar with Dr. Weiss, he is a professor and a microbiologist and a veterinary medical specialist in internal diseases. He's also the chief of infection control over at the OVC Teaching Hospital. He's very highly spoken of. He has an incredible blog, The Worms and Germs. I mean, I'm all over that. Selfishly, I'm on that every single morning getting updates from you, Dr. Weiss. And I'm just going to jump right into it. There is a study that just recently came out, and I was reading your article about it. The study done on cats and ferrets, there's a lot of confusion. There's headlines all over the world world saying you got to watch out for your cats. I was hoping that we could open it up with this and you could tell us a little bit about what the heck is going on. Yeah, well, that study's caused a lot of kind of attention, some panic, and ultimately it's an interesting study. It was important to see it. It doesn't change the story really at all from what we've been saying. Um, we've known, looking back to the original SARS virus that this one is closely related to, that virus could infect some animals, could infect cats, could infect ferrets. And both of those could pass it on. And this virus is very closely related. We fully expected it to do the same thing. We've seen a couple spillover infections in dogs in Hong Kong and, and more recently a couple of cats. The question we have, is this a purely human virus now or is it a predominantly human virus? So this started off in animals, jumped to people, and it's a human virus now. There's no doubt about that. Um, is there any role of animals? If there is, it's very small. But we don't want to ignore it. If it's a very small part of a very big problem, there's still something we want to pay attention to. But ultimately, if I'm going to get this infection, it's almost certainly going to come from a person, not from an animal. And looking at my own animals, the risk is actually to my animals from me as opposed to from them to me. Because, you know, the way that we're going to get COVID in the household is a person bringing it into the household because my animals don't see any other animals and they don't see other people, but they're socially distanced like we're trying you to do. And I'm probably the weak link because I'm the one that gets out more. And Dr. Weiss, when, when we see headlines in Europe, when they say that, that this is a possibility that kitties could be harboring this virus, compared to the laboratory setting versus real life setting, I feel like in the lab there's this whopper dose, this, this massive dose of virus that they use experimentally that that wouldn't even necessarily translate into a real life scenario would it yeah it's hard to say right experimental models are experimental models they tell us some information but they don't tell us the whole story um but they're important to get us thinking about it so they infected these cats and ferrets and they tried dogs as well and some poultry and pigs by putting a virus up their nose or in their their trachea in the windpipe so that's a little different than what we've encountered uh, and they used a, a reasonable bit of virus now does that mean a cat's exposed to a person is going to get infected? That's the tough part to say, although we know we've got a couple cats that have been reported now with this virus. Now, the bigger issue from that study, I think, is or the animals being able to pass it on to another animal. So if they took an infected cat or took an infected ferret and put it next to an uninfected cat or a ferret, they were able to see transmission, most from the ferrets. And one of the big questions really is, if you look at 100 or 1,000 cats that are owned by people with COVID, is it one or two that are infected or is it, you know, 50 or 100 or 900 that are infected? And we don't know that. If it's one of a thousand, then it's a really, really niche issue. If it's, you know, 500, then we need to pay more attention and we just don't know at this point. And that creates fear. And that's a big problem, right? When people don't know and they see headlines, they get afraid. And what we're trying to message is, well, the risk isn't zero. We don't know what the risk is, but that there's some degree of risk potentially. Putting it in the grand scheme of things, that risk is probably low. And that risk from your pet is probably exceptionally low. And the key point is we can do some basic things to reduce that risk. So social distancing, washing your hands. You know, if I'm sick, I'm staying away from other people. I stay away from other animals. So we talk about social distancing a lot, right? And we often focus on social distancing, meaning stay away from other people. For me, social distancing is staying away from anything with a pulse. Right? So I'm not just staying away from you, I'm staying away from your dog and your cat and any other animals that I see because, you know, the risk of transmitting to them is really low. But if I don't encounter them, we don't need to worry about it. So if we got a sick person, okay, stay away from animals. If you've got a sick person and you've been exposed to your animal, well, just keep your animal away from someone else because then it really doesn't matter in the big picture if there's no potential transmission after that. 
so currently at the moment, what we're seeing right now overseas is um, the panic t for people to protect their pets. And so one of those things that they're doing would be masks. You're seeing all over the internet, people sort of hand making DIY masks, onesies. I think I was, we were talking about that earlier. I was, uh, the photo that's gone pretty viral online and people in Venezuela are using like pajamas, onesies, pajamas of children, trying to protect them. Um, everybody is trying to make a mask because of course it's almost impossible nowadays to find a mask anywhere. Are these pet owners basically gonna be able to protect their cats by putting these masks onto their cats and dogs? Dogs. What, what's your take on these masks? Well, the way you protect your animal is you keep it away from sick people. I think masks might cause more problems than they help with, especially with dogs. Like, how do dogs cool off? They can't. You put something over their mouth, especially something that you know makes it harder for that airflow. It's going to get a lot of moisture there. It's going to get sopping wet. Um, they might eat them. <laughs> we get foreign body issues. So I think they're the odds of them being useful are very very low. The other thing to remember is what masks are designed to do. Now, if you're wearing a mask just around the street, a mask isn't really designed to protect you. It's designed to protect people from you. Now, it'll protect you a little bit, but what it's really designed to do is as you're talking or coughing or breathing, you're keeping those droplets and aerosols in your mouth and in the mask. You're not spreading them around. It's not helping you for things that are coming at you as much because you got two big things that your eyes that are able to get infected. And if people are wearing a mask around their, under their nose, which they often do, it's an even more of a problem. So to put a mask on a dog, the risk of them getting exposed is really low. There are better things we can do to reduce that risk. The protective effect is probably very, very low. And the risk of adverse effects, I think, probably probably greatly outweigh any potential benefit. The other thing that we're seeing, Dr. Reese, in addition to people masking their animals, is to try to disinfect them with really caustic substances. So people are using bleach, people are using everything that's imaginable, spraying, dipping, washing, and that's something that has just kind of trended this last week, that, that people's thought process is, well, maybe I should wipe my dogs down. In fact, even some veterinarians in the US I've seen um, are starting to wipe dogs down. but. How what research has been done that those solutions are viable at removing you know virus particles and what how what concentration do we need it seems like that wiping animals down would be first of all ineffective and second of all potentially dangerous as well yeah it's one of these we don't have information on it can be useful in some circumstances could be harmful in some circumstances again your average dog and cat walking down the street the odds of them getting some virus on them very very low my dog and cat zero essentially right and if they do they got it from me or my kids and that's the biggest risk now there are some situations where we do get worried about it we just don't know what the risk is the question is can the virus survive on a dog or a cat's hair coat well it's not really the question the question is how long can it survive because if i'm infected and i cough on my dog or i touch my nose and i pet my cat you know i put virus there and it's alive is it staying there for minutes or hours or days? Well, it's probably more on the minutes to hours side. This virus can live a couple days on things like plastic and stainless steel, shorter durations on other types of surfaces. You know, our, our animals aren't made of plastic or steel, so we don't know what to, to think about that, but it's probably in that minutes to hours range. So the situation where we really think this is relevant is, okay, let's say that you're infected and you're in the house and you're cuddling with your dog or your cat and they get sick and they need to go to a vet clinic. So they've been in contact with you and then I'm seeing them within, you know, minutes or hours. Okay, maybe there's a plausible risk there. And that's why with clinics, we've got some protocols saying, okay, if they're coming from a positive household, here are some things we can think about. We can give them a bath, just a soap and water bath to flush it off. Now, that might work with some species, depending on how nice your cat is, depending if the animal's got a fractured leg, we're not going to bathe it. What we get worried about is people taking it in their own hands and applying any disinfectant at a high concentration. Bleach can be useful, but it's at very, very low concentrations. If you look at bleach baths, those are used in some animals and, and some people, you're looking at about two mils per liter. So that's a one in 500 dilution of your household bleach. So it's not dumping bleach on or a little splash of bleach and a splash of water. If they're going to use it, they need to be careful because bleach is very caustic. Um, you know, water can help. So just a good damp cloth. Physical removal of this virus will help. Soapy water will potentially help too. Alcohol, you know, it doesn't work all that well on dirty surfaces. So if it doesn't touch it and has to hit that and evaporate and not have a lot of debris around. So alcohol is not a great one. Peroxide, you know, it probably work if it touches it. It can be a little bit harsh. It can certainly be if there's damaged tissue, peroxide is not the best thing. But again, for your average person and your average animal, there's really little chance that you need to do this. It's only if you think the animals had direct contact with someone that's infected. 
and very short term, right? Within that minutes to hours after a few hours or a few days in particular is gone. Dr. Ruiz, what about pets and Corona vaccines? There's a lot of confusion out there because people are confusing all of the different coronaviruses that are available. And their thought is, if there is a vaccine available for pets, I'll just go get that. Can you help clarify the, the confusion surrounding pets and Corona vaccines? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a really common question. And the other thing is, okay, my, my dog's had a coronavirus infection before. Is it safe? Or, you know, I'm a veterinarian. I get exposed to coronavirus all the time. Am I protected? Unfortunately, the answer is no at all of those. Uh, coronaviruses are very different. Uh, this is a very different virus than the coronaviruses that we see. And there's not any suspicion at all that previous exposure or vaccination is going to be protective. There are other human coronaviruses as well, some that cause the common cold, and we don't have evidence that they're protective for this virus. So vaccinating your dog against coronavirus isn't going to help protect it or you, unfortunately. You know, I was reading one of your articles that you wrote on surfaces. This is like the one of the biggest questions in the world everyone's freaked out about amazon packages in the human side in the pet space one of the one of the biggest fears is the leash the transfer of the leash me handing my leash over to you or going to the to the pet store buying a bag of food or having like say home delivery somebody delivering that bag of food am i going to take that bag of food and soak it in soap and water? Yeah, there are no straight answers, right? So if, if i'm going into a store and buying a bag of food and, and coming home my biggest risk is my drive there and back my biggest risk is inhaling food. Yeah, someone could be in there and they could have coughed on it right before. This virus doesn't live very long. There are some viruses that live a long time. Parvovirus in animals is kind of our classic. It'll live for months. This one doesn't, which is good. So if someone happened to have contaminated, it's probably a low level of virus that's there. And it's probably going to die fairly quickly. Yeah, if I'm really concerned, I could wipe it down or I could leave the bag alone. If that bag sits for a day or two, there's no risk there at all. People are getting groceries delivered. You know, here's where we're relying on the service industries to help us out. So if the grocery store or the pet food store or whatever is making sure their people are healthy, that drops that risk a lot. Um, Like there's no no risk. But I think if we start getting afraid of everything, it's not going to help. If people are freaking out about every surface they could run into, they're going to make themselves sick quicker than coronavirus is going to. Dr. Becker and I had done a previous interview uh, with Dr. Sarah Caddy. When we had done that interview, I had a few Indonesian reporters message me and they said to me, they were like, Rodney Habib, your recommendation and your American Canadian recommendations of kissing pets is irresponsible because 80% of people or whatever the statistic is of people that can be carriers and be asymptomatic and so on and so forth, your pets should be locked in another room and should not come out until this whole pandemic is over. What's your take on this type of stuff? Yeah, I I think one of the big take homes really for me is from a disease standpoint, a containment standpoint, pets are people too. And I don't think about people and pets and households. I think about households. So I've got kids and pets I'm going to treat them similarly in terms of containment. So I want them socially distancing. I don't want my kids hanging around with anyone else, and I don't want my pets hanging around anyone else. And if I do that, my kids hanging around with my pets doesn't pose a risk, right? Because we're trying to keep it out of the household. If it's in the household, it's going to be spreading in people probably. So the animal side of that is a byproduct. So as long as we're not letting those animals go out and expose, getting them exposed to other people, that are infected, my animals don't pose a risk. So if we do a really good job of socially distancing our whole household, human and animal, then what happens in that household doesn't matter. I'm not going to stay away from my kids because I'm worried about them. I'm socially isolating so that we don't get kids infected. So I don't have to be afraid of getting near my kids or my wife. And same thing with my pets. If I do a good job of doing everything I can to keep this virus out of the household, I don't have to worry about my animals. And ultimately, again, this is primarily a human problem. We've got animal issues we need to pay attention to, potential issues, and we want to take common sense measures. But that's basic things like, you know, stay away from animals that you're sick, socially distance with your animals, remember some common sense hygiene practices, and remember that your pet in your household poses virtually no risk to you if we use some common sense. If what I'm hearing you say is, in summary, that just as we are being socially responsible as families, we just need to include our pets in that and be wise about making sure that their contact is minimized, just as ours is right now, when we're still learning and research is still coming out. We don't know exactly. A lot of these questions we have, we don't have answers to because the research hasn't been done with pets. So just be as wisely protective with your dogs and cats as you would be with your kids. 
Um, and at this point, that's the best information that we can offer people. Abandoning your pets, being afraid of your pets, or hyper protecting your pets are all totally unnecessary measures. Absolutely. It's treating your pets like your kids. So I'm not going to let my kids go to the park and run around and roll on top of other kids right now. So why would I do that with my dog? Uh, the risk to the kids is higher kid to kid than my dog, dog to dog, but I can eliminate that risk really practically. So it's just a matter of it's common sense. It's relaxing as much as possible, which is difficult in this time of getting so much information. It is such a big problem. But ultimately, we can only control what we can control, right? I can control how I interact with people and how my animals interact with people and how I wash my hands. And if I focus on those things, then the animal concerns really get out the door. Dr. Weiss, thank you so much for, for jumping on and speaking to all the pet parents all around the world. Hopefully, we can have you back again for more updates. I know this thing is just every day every week there's new developments and i know things are continuously changing i know for a scientist like yourself this must be nerve-wracking every time giving advice and things keep constantly spinning so hopefully we can bring you again in the future to everyone watching thank you so much stay safe keep your pets safe and we'll see you again